All right, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I've now calmed down from running around all day and we can have a, a lovely meeting. We've got a lot of topics today. And um, we, I think the taking notes part, the video just seems to work better, you know, it, than trying to do it. I, I run the transcript just in case we want to, if there's something we want to go back and quickly review or pass out. But I think we'll just go with the recording and go from there. So let's do around the room. And I, I will try. Let's do, let's do what other people do. Keep track of who's. No, let's just try and keep track of who's already said who they are rather than me try and call it out and bounce it to the, to the next person. So I'm going to start with someone who's off of me, Ann Forrest. Uh, will you go ahead and introduce yourself and your neighborhood or hub? Hi, everybody. Ann Forrest. I'm in Victory Heights, uh, so Northeast Seattle. And I'm going to pass the baton to Frank. Yeah, you would do that when I'm off. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Frank Gall, West Magnolia Hub and ACS. And I'll pass it on to uh, Bill Fay. Yes, this is Bill Fay. Uh, I'm with the Queen Anne Hub as well as ACS and uh, MICWA Hubs, our little local uh, emergency prep group. So we'll pass it off to Cheryl. Hi, I'm Cheryl Dyer, uh, Loyal Heights Hub in Ballard. And let's go to Gabrielle. Gabrielle Gerhard, I'm with the Windermere North Hub um, and I will pass it off to Louise. I'm Louise Luthi Laurel Hub. And who would you like to pass to? Oh, and that part as well, Susanna. Okay, I'm Susanna Cunningham. I'm from the Lake City Hub and the ACS and I'll pass it off to Jack. Ah, thank you, um, Jack, and uh, I'm with the Finney Hub uh, co-captain, and I will pass it off to Ann Bond. Hi, everybody. Ann Bond. I'm with the East Lake Hub, which is on the east side of Lake Union, and I'll pass it off to Matt. Assume that one's me. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Weeb. I'm with the uh, Wallingford Hub, uh, and I'll pass it off to Carl Leon. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Carl Leon. I was co-founder of the Broadview Hubs, and I'm deputy director of CLACS. And I will pass it. I can't keep track of who held Mike Ruby. How about Mike? Well, I'm Mike Ruby from uh, Wallingford, and. Uh, I'm going to have to be talking to Matt about uh, trying to get something organized for uh, Cascadia Rising. Great. I'll, I'll start Sounds helping good. now because I'm keeping track. So Matt Blank, go ahead, and then followed by Erica. Yeah, uh, Matt Blank, Ravenna Hub. Erica and then Gina. Erica, uh, Highland Park Improvement Center um, in West Seattle. Uh, Gina, Brayburn Hub on Capitol Hill. Okay, and then we'll do Hugh, and then uh, there was a Phil, and he just disappeared. So after after Hugh, I'm here. Johnny. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Hugh Kelso, Kirk and Park Hub. Johnny Schmidt, High Point Hub in High Point, West Seattle. And I'm Cindy Barker with the Morgan Junction Hub, and then Phil. I'm Phil Wood with Wallingford. Yeah, no kidding, Wallingford's in the house today. Excellent. Is there anybody we missed? Yes, me. I'm uh, Susan, Susan Speaker with the Bradner Gardens Hub in Mount Baker. Excellent. Wow, great turnout tonight. Thank you, everybody. Dave Wilma, Seattle ACS. I live in the uh, Licton Springs neighborhood. Dave, I'm so sorry. I was sure Susanna was going to call on you, so I blanked. So, all right. <laughs> well, and we have some great ACS participation today because one of the things we're going to talk about, the first thing on the agenda is the exercise coming up on June 11th, and Ann Forrest is going to talk us through that. All right. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so we're going to talk about ICS 
forms really quickly what they look like for um, the hub captain. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, this is an ICS 213. ICS stands for Incident Command System. 213 is just a number they gave to the really general form. It says general message right up there. So it's used for a lot of purposes. And what we're going to concentrate on is the numbering system. So right up here in the top corner. So close up of that page I just showed you, these are the forms that we had printed with grant money and we got 10,000 copies. So uh, plenty to give out for folks to use. We'll, we'll give a little stash to all of our hubs and then um, all of the, uh, give half to the ACS folks as well. We did a, a dual purchase. So we're gonna talk about these grade blocks, which is exactly, this is a picture of the forms that we got. So this is exactly what you're gonna see when you see the forms. <laughs> so there are seven, blocks and then a hyphen and then four blocks. So we're gonna talk about how to fill those out. And then I'll talk about why we fill them out. So for the hubs, we're gonna start there. The first two blocks will consist of your sector and then a hyphen, which you'll have to, to put in there. So third block is a hyphen. And then the next four are the hub designator codes, which Cindy's been working on and trying to get everybody to verify those, that four digit code that is unique to your hub. And then there's a hyphen that is printed on the document already. So you don't have to put this second one in. And then there's four digits, which is the message number. So again, the sector you're in, your designator for your particular hub, and then what number message this is. And all of your messages will be sequential. It'll be one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, five, and then one, two, three, six. So uh, this is a bunch of examples of how it could look. This is the Northwest hub. This is the Greenwood designator. And this happens to be message number 4732. This is Southeast. This is High Point Neighborhood House and their message number 6826. Central... And of course that was supposed to be Southwest. Oh, sorry, sorry, yep. <laughs> um, and then Central East is the Brayburn Hub, 0034. So this is how you would deal with leading zeros. Uh, Northeast, this is the University Heights designator, 0689. So those are a couple examples of what you might see on message traffic. It's and good that hub, hub people are paying attention, Anne. Yeah, I'm impressed. Good job, guys. So if you were to see a message that originated, so the person that originates the message is who fills in those blanks at the top. And that message does not, those, those blanks, what's written in those blanks does not change as it makes its way from wherever it's originating to wherever it needs to go. All the layers it goes through, they do not change that number. So for example, a message that originated at the EOC is going to start with EOC. Four blanks, a hyphen, and then message number wherever they are. Could be 0001, it could be you know, 9,000, doesn't matter. So that's coming from the EOC, that's what it would look like, super simple. If it Let's was say coming, EOC. what's that? What is the EOC? Oh, sorry. Good question. Emergency Operations Center. So theoretically, if everything works the way they want it to, the Emergency Operations Center is downtown Seattle. It's uh, near the fire department. They're in the same building as the fire department. So that's where all the the um, major players in a disaster will gather to to. Um, coordinate the response. And there's so a emergency question. operation center. There's a question yeah. in chat. Confirmation okay. start with message number 0001 and then go up from there. Uh, sorry, I'm struggling to get to the chat box. No, that's okay. Um, is that a question? It is. Um, He's asking confirmation. Um, Would you start yeah. with 001 and then go up? No. So let me get to that in just a second. Um, and then Carl said the message number is the red number at the top right of the form. Yeah. 
So I'll get I'll get to both those statements oh, in just a second. Oh. So um, if the message originated at an ACS sector, auxiliary communication services, the radio folks, if they're generating the message, it's going to start with their name, ACS. This happens to be the Northwest ACS sector. And then there's a blank for them and then whatever message number they're on. So that's what it looks like if it starts with ACS at one of their sector locations. And then these are kind of outliers a little bit. Um, the, these are just examples. This one would be shelter 99 and their message number. And then this one would be a ham radio operator that's kind of out there um, working on his own or his or her own a little bit. Um, so is not associated with an ACS sector, is not associated with a hub, um, but maybe is doing work and is communicating with everybody that's on ham radio. This is that person's call sign, N7KUW. So they would use their five digit call sign if they were the run one originating the message and again, number it. So um, this is an example of how the message, how it traveled. So in this example, the hub is starting this message, is originating this message, and they're, they're on number 4502. So that message, that message number, whatever hub, you know, Northwest, whatever sector they're in and whatever their hub designator is and number 4502 is followed, follows the message from the hub to the ACS operator, the ACS operator to the um, ACS sector, and then on up to the emergency operations center, the EOC. And when it gets to the emergency operations center, it will say it's from the hub, it's, it's message number 4502, and this is what we need, for example. When you're responding, so this is the emergency operations center is now the originator of this next message. And so because they're the originator, it's going to say EOC. And let's say it's message 0138. And that EOC 0138 follows that message all the way back down to the hub for that response. What they do is, the message is the message number is different because it originated at the EOC, but in the body of the message, it will say in response to hub message 4502, this is our answer, blah, blah, blah. So that's how the original message is hooked up with the answer is that the original message number is in the body of that response. So Carl has raised his hand. Yeah, go ahead, Carl. So go back one slide, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, this one, one more forward. forward. There we go. It, that in response to should have the entire message number, which would be the, the sector designator, the hub designator, and the number, because it that's part of how we know where to send the message back to is is that it can and and a message in our case the message numbering scheme that we've collectively devised here that's um having all of that prep preceding part makes it part of the message number so if we down the road we tried message numbering several years you know this has been a five or eight year battle with how to message numbers the last time we played this game we kept running into conflicts because we had two ABCD hubs in the city. So now they were conflicting. So that's one of the reasons Cindy and Anne have worked so hard to come up with a complete list of unique names for the hubs. But by appending the sector in front of it, we actually could duplicate a hub, four letter hub designator between the Northeast sector and the Southeast sector because the directional is also part of the message number. Hope that all makes sense to everybody. Yeah. It's, it's trying to bulletproof it because if we get hubs in the field and they have forgotten their designator and you know they accidentally end up using the same one or you know it just helps differentiate. So 
Yeah, good input, Carl. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, Carl. So yeah, in the response, it, you won't just put the four digit numbers. You're gonna put the whole Northeast sector. This is my hub designator and this is the message number. So the whole thing in the response. And, and turn the direction around. If the EOC sends a request to a hub for information, the hub would originate a new message with its message number back to the EOC in response to EOC dash whatever. So right, yeah. Thanks. Um, so if you don't have numbers for numbered forms, and let me, I'm going to back up to the beginning of this. So you asked about the numbers. We have ten thousand of these forms from zero 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 one to nine 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 basically, or 10,000 or whatever. Um, so like I just gave Carl a stack of these and I don't know, I gave him 200 forms and it started with 5,200 and went to 5,400 or something like that. So the numbers, we shouldn't have too many overlapping numbers because again, because none of these forms are numbered the same. It is sequential from 0001 to 10,000. So I don't think we're gonna have the same numbers, but if for some reason you run out of numbered forms and you have just blank ICS forms to use, start your own numbering system, but every, and so you can start with 0001. It doesn't matter where you start. You could start with 2000, it doesn't matter. But every radio operator that comes after you has to use that same system. Not every radio operator that shows up gets to start with 0001. In that they're... exercise or in yes. that disaster scenario. Yeah. So wherever that first radio operator starts, let's say they start at 2000, everybody following behind them as a radio operator needs to keep going down that sequential path of 2000 plus. And the reason that for sense. that is, is so we can go back and did we lose a message? Do we have all of the message that is that hub X sent? Uh, if you sequentially number your messages from wherever you start for the duration of the event, then you will have consistency and we'll be able to track. Did we get the message? And you'll be able to track Did they reply to message, whatever. So, and the same thing, if you don't remember what your assigned hub designator is and you make one up, um, okay, you made it up. The sector, a four digit, four letter hub designator, from that point forward for this event, this exercise or this uh, activation, be consistent. Continue to use whatever you started out with um, throughout the event. And don't change it from operator to operator. And that's the message yeah. manager, that's the radio operator, that's whoever is creating or working with messages throughout the process. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, nobody goes rogue on this exercise or, or on a drill. Um, uh, and then my suggestion, I haven't had a chance to talk to Cindy, but this is a two-page, Carl put together a really nice two-page document. So, you know, let's say we don't have, um, we don't have to use this for two and a half years. Um, this is all written down. It's not rocket science. It's a front and back page. I'm going to suggest that you print it and I'll send it out, numbering it with page 27 and put it in the back of your radio operator manual. So it's there when you need it. Okay. So you don't have to remember any of this, but we do want to explain what it is. Um, so that's all I had for the ICS 213s. Any other questions? Jack's got something in chat. Yeah, we need to I, we need to get the forms out to everybody. Haven't really figured out how to do that since we're not gathering too much in person, but um, we'll figure it out. And then I kind of have to figure out how many to give to each each hub. Yeah. Jack's question sort of got truncated. Oh, there it is. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, what do uh, we do if a form page and sequence number is not used for some and reason? Said for some reason. It, I think it's not used. Um, yeah, if hmm. you if you're not like going if you one, accidentally two, three, four, one. and you know you got a form that uh, is d destroyed for whatever reason, and and you're not in sequence, you're looking for sequential numbers series to determine whether. Uh, 
you know, people have been had responses to uh, yeah. their uh, their questions or whatever. Uh, yeah. What do I'm we do take, about that? I, I think Carl has told us in the past, you, you treat it like a checkbook. You write the yeah. thing down and you write void. void. You, should, you should be logging every message. And if you skip one, put it in your log. Message 5341 skipped. Yeah. Yeah, but the, uh, you were talking about, uh, at, as I understood, uh, at, at the higher levels, you know, past the hub, you checking to see that, uh, uh, that you know, messages were answered, you know, with the sequential number series. I mean, do, do you want us to send you uh, so if uh, I'm, if messages I'm saying, uh, you know, that we've destroyed or, you know, that, that the message number, blah, 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 is, is not... Is a void. I my suggestion is this: if, like, if I'm at the HCS sector at the EOC and I'm getting messages from your hub and I see a number missed, I would probably come back and ask you what happened to message whatever. You would look in your log. You would say, "Oh, we we didn't use that number. We skipped it." That's all I need to know. Okay, got it. But I wouldn't volunteer that information unless it was requested. Yeah, the possibility exists that your message may be going to another hub and not the EOC. So the EOC wouldn't necessarily see that message number. Uh, I don't think we're going to be doing that kind of an audit uh, on, the, yeah. on the message graphic. We're not Erica that good. Hand <laughs> uh, so I'm just sort of curious about, with at least with regard to the hubs, to be able to know, like have like a, a master list of what the designator. Right now we're in the Google Docs. Um, um, it is once we get those all identified. Uh, just having gone through, you know, updating the EOC map, is this something that those of us who are working on that, that ArcGIS want to make sure and we want to put that in? So like the EOC, no? Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't bother, but I am going to put this all in that master spreadsheet that lives at the very top of our Google Docs that lists hubs and hub captain name and address. And it's our master repository of all the information tied to the hub, but I don't think you guys need to enter it in GIS. Okay, um, but is, should we also like, um, uh, Anne said we should print out the instructions on how to do this. Should we also print out to have the list so that the person would know which, you know, if it's a hub to hub, so they know what the correct, where it's coming from. Because I'm just yeah. thinking of scenarios where it's like you're with, it's within sector communication. You're trying to like pass information about resources. You want to know with that which of those is the closest to your hub and such and such. So and people are not necessarily going to remember these off the at, during during. Well, the no, I, yeah. I I don't. Can you bring up the 13? Because really, the the ICS 13 has to and from. So we want to use the English, you know, we want to say from Alki to High Point or from, you know, so that is all separate from the numbering. So okay. I, I see what you're asking, but it's off to the left. Of, I, I can't see that, it on my That's screen. one more in. Oh, I'm still sharing. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Well, I assumed you were going to share for the next topic. So I there you go. Gonna bug you. Yeah. So it's to and from. So you're going to have your English version of who okay. it is. The numbering is just internal to your hub as your okay. originating number. Okay, it's to keep track, but it's not for us to use to actually be able to decode for location identification. Oh my God. In the okay. middle of a disaster? No, thank you. <laughs> that's, not, that's why I was asking this question. <laughs> so make sure you write down your designator, but not, the, not necessarily everybody else's. Yeah. So, uh, Anne, you're going to talk the exercise next, right? Sure. Okay, and yeah. then I actually, that just checked off the third agenda item because um, the ham radio, once we figure out the radio designators, I will put them in that master list in a new column. And, you know, we, we, you know we'll have new hubs and we always will have to deconflict that we're not doubling up on stuff. But that's why it was really important for you guys to all kind of lock in what you wanted. And then we can deal with the P patch hubs and make their assignments just in case they ever activate. So Anne's going to talk to us next, and that's why some of the ACS folks are on, is about the exercise on June 11th. 
Yeah, this is really just kind of a, a repeat of what we talked about last time we were all together. I think it was at the deep dive. Um, so June 11th, 9 a.m., ACS and hubs are having an exercise. The goal of that drill is um, testing direct communication. So ham radio to ham radio without repeaters to see what kind of coverage we get across the city. And then the ham radio, ham radio operators that are out in the field are going to be pushed to use WindLink, which is sending email over radio waves. So different than FL Digi, different than voice communications, it's sending emails over the radio. And the other goal of this exercise is just getting the ACS operators out to different hub locations so they know where they are, they know where the closest one is. Um, you know, we're, we're looking for a face-to-face -face with somebody from your hub, whether it's the hub captain or one of your volunteers, but we would like face-to-face -face communication. We're gonna get, we're gonna get radio injects to everybody that needs them. And some of those will go to the hub captains so that you can give it to the hub rate, to the radio operator sitting at your hub location. While you're there talking to the radio, the ham radio operator, you might be talking about, this is where I see us putting up our, our, um, our canopy. This is where we think the greeter will be. This is kind of where I think you might wanna set up your radio so that they can start testing and see whether or not that's actually a good area to get a good signal. So some collaboration between the hub captain and the ACS member is what we're looking for. And then depending on who plays along, and I don't, we don't need this information until right before the exercise, but we need to know who's going to have a hub volunteer out at a hub location. And then I need to be able to get them the injects so that, that you're giving a piece of paper to the ham radio operator so that they can transmit it. Um, so yeah, need to know who's gonna play along and then I need to get those injects to those folks. So I will be going out with an email saying who wants to do this. Again, we don't need, we don't need you signing up right now but I do need you signing up before like Friday before the, the exercise. So any questions, I see something in chat. Who will have radios? I'm sorry? We don't have a radio. Uh, I can't see who's talking. Mike, Is this Mike Ruby, can you cover that one for, for Wallingford? Yes, that was my intention. OK, thanks. We'll talk to you. Yep. <laughs> He's your man. Yeah. We haven't really talked about using GMRS radios, mostly because there's nobody on the ACS side that is going to be able to pick up your transmission on a GMRS frequency. So um, GMRS basically is not playing in this exercise. Unless you can think of some creative way to do it, but it's not, it's really not in the planning. So yeah. Boo. Yeah, sorry. Well, <laughs> so the, the net effect for the hub captains is uh, being able to be at your with your radio operator at the start of the exercise, make sure they sit in the place where you want them to be in real operations so they get a test of the real world, because part of this is will simplex work, and then to be able to hand off injects. Um, do we need to hand those off during the entire exercise, all three hours? That's a good question. Um, Dave had his hand raised. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thank you, Ann. Uh, moving back, uh, Cindy, uh, we'll use we'll do we'll process the injects uh, as long as possible. And if we have, for example, more hubs than operators, we might redeploy operators uh, like at ten thirty or eleven uh, to give them an opportunity to familiarize themselves with another hub. Um, so, uh, but uh, we'll use the injects for as long as as they last. Uh, the uh, operators will have some additional tasks to do, including receive an FL Digi message or two for the hubs themselves. So the hubs will be receiving uh, uh, injects from uh, simulated from the EOC. Um, if you have your own favorite uh, ham who is not part of ACS or has not volunteered, uh, please invite them to participate uh, because uh, 
this might this will give you an opportunity, first of all, to have your own resource, your own ham, uh, but it'll give us some practice on incorporating uh, spontaneous volunteers uh, into the operation. Uh, I have about two dozen ACS volunteers signed up now. And uh, so that's anywhere from three to four uh, per sector. Uh, some have indicated a preference where they want to go, and I will try to accommodate that. But the first order of business will be to fill those hub locations where we know uh, volunteers will staff. Dave, what are you telling your, your radio operators about how long a hub captain is going to stand out there at their, at their hub site? Are we expected uh, to be there from nine to noon or? I expected to be there. I, uh, that's a good question. We'll say as long as the uh, uh, hub operator wants. Uh, if they want to uh, uh, stand down at 10 or 1030, uh, they're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, the main thing is, is that uh, they've contacted the hub location. It may give us an opportunity to redeploy the operators, um, but again, it'll depend on uh, what hub locations we want to staff. I guess my, my question is, let's say a hub, uh, hub guy wants to do, you know, do something, but they can only be there for the first hour, but they'd be happy to leave the stack of injects and your radio operator keep picking them up every 10 minutes. Is that legit? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the main thing is, is and, and that's, you know, that's uh, typical. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, these hubs are not the fire department. I mean, they're not going to be staffed 24-7. Uh, so uh, that may be a, a, a realistic situation. Okay. Any other questions for Ann? Great. Can I make another comment on the message numbering? Uh, sure. let, let Frank go because I think he had an exercise question, then we'll come back to the numbering. Frank, you have to unmute. Yeah, my question is um, the red number at the top of the ACS form is a uh, what five digit number and the number on the uh, actual 213 on the right has four spaces. So for the purpose of the exercise, and I'm, I'm not afraid of sounding stupid, are we using the pre-designated ones with the red number at the top or at West Magnolia, am I gonna start with uh, West Magnolia 0001 when I deal with the first inject. In other words, the stuff with the red numbers at the top, are they when we're gonna be in a real world situation and we're saving them? Or are we gonna use them in this exercise? Well, part of it is that Anne got a special bonus in that there was a printing error. And so we have, I forget the number, 10,000 extra screwed up forms that don't make a difference for us in an exercise. Okay. Uh, so I don't, don't really know the answer to your question, Frank, but yeah, so we have, we ordered 10,000. We got, yeah, we ordered 10,000 with numbers on them. They came without numbers. So then they sent us another 10,000 with numbers. So we got 20,000 copies, half numbered, half not for a really low price. So we want to use we want to use them. I would say we will try and get the unnumbered ones out for this exercise. It was the, the buy one get two free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm eager to get these out to you guys and to the ACS members because yeah. they're taking well, up some space in my basement. No, I really appreciate the work you guys have done on this. As Carl said, this has been around the block many times. I'm just thinking, how do I explain this to someone who's brand new on this? And I sort of want to leave out the red numbers and just go back to your initial description of Central West, West Magnolia Playfield 0001 for the first inject we do to, to keep the training exercise simple. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Perfect. A, a comment on that, Frank, and you actually had two questions there. If you are using a form that has a red number on it, Use the red number. Use that number. Yeah. Okay. If you have a form that does not have a red number on it, start numbering wherever you want and be consistent from that point on. And starting with 0001 makes sense. Also, the numbers on the red forms do have a leading zero. Just ignore the leading zero. You're only going to use the four significant digits of that number. The, um, reason, the reason why we say use the red numbers is because in an exercise, people if they don't have a prompt in front of them, they'll get confused. 
you know, it means that you would have to keep a really good log with your radio assistant, and we don't do that very well. So having that number printed keeps is, is another step in bulletproofing. So keep those for the real world and mess it up on the exercise. And also, all of these forms are two-part carbonless forms. So you write the form out, you tear the carbon off and keep it in your file. The original goes to the wherever it's going, et cetera. So you've got a file copy with the number on it. And that's that's the beauty of this system. Yep. Forgot to tell you guys that. Yeah. Bottom copy is canary yellow. So Carl, did you, was that part of what you wanted to comment on or you got something else? Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is even if you're not using the specific ICS 213 form, well, Anne, can you throw the form back up with the message number one more time? Sure. The one thing I wanted to comment, yeah, I know what I wanted to comment on. The actual ICS 213 form does not have this message number shaded blocks and all of that. So if you download an ICS 213 from FEMA website, it won't, all it'll have on the top line is something, you know, that, that message, the circled area here, it's just a white box all the way across on, on a regular 213. So if you're using a regular 213 or if you're using a ICS-1, a, a yellow notepad, <laughs> if you're using anything to write a message on and you don't have this pre-printed format, continue to use the format, the process we're using to assign message numbers to your messages. Okay, so include the sector designator, the hub designator, and a four-digit numerical designator that incre increments sequentially as you send more messages. Whether it's on this form, whether it's on a form that doesn't have that pre-printed on it, or whether it's on a blank piece of paper that you're originating messages on, number your messages. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on that topic? All right, let's move along because we got a bunch of little updates and we want to do some tie-in because there's a lot of activities going on. Uh, next is the Zoom account for hubs. So I got ready to transition leadership, running the meetings so that you don't have to live with my crappy internet from the trailer. And um, so this during this cycle, I'm documenting stuff for... Um, the folks who said they would help start running meetings. And we kind of ran into this problem of the Zoom account that we use is in my name. I use it for a bunch of other stuff. And if I want to be in the meeting, it interrupts the person running the meeting. So it didn't ma matter when I was running all the meetings, but it makes this transition kind of weird. So we are, uh, Anne's got some information on Zoom to talk about how we buy our own account, how we manage it, what it costs. Hint, hint, we've got $5,700 still in the bank account because we're so cheap, we're not spending anything. Anne, go ahead. I am going to suggest that we do just the, just the pro account, which is what Cindy has, what I have, probably what many of you have who get tired of the Zoom kicking you off after 40 minutes. Um, can you There's, expand the Zoom or the, the vision of that? I can't see uh, the details. There you I, go. I don't know if it's, does this help when I, whoops. Previously, I saw it as a full screen thing. Close your other screen, Ann. That, the ICS form is behind it. That might be. Uh, and, and the one thing, we're hoping that there are hub captains out there with kind of more experience like I just run these single type meetings and what we need to make sure is we get an account that has administrators so that multiple of you can have the password and log in and it's not limited to a single person. Sorry. Ah. Um. <clears throat> We so you not can share the credentials on a pro account, but only one there we instance go. is going to be able to log in. That's good. Thank you. Okay. So Matt, say that again, please. Um, I mean, if you purchase the, the pro account, you're, you're basically going to get one account tied to one email address, one password. Uh, so you can share that with a number of people, but only one can log in at a time. So that would mean if, if we got it, like 
like it'd be the same problem now. If I had it, my name, my password, and I had to be in another meeting right now, that doesn't work. Cindy, if if you're if you're going into Zoom only to attend a meeting someone other someone else is hosting, you don't have to sign into your account. Just just log into Zoom without signing into your account, and that'll keep the account free. Yeah, and the that, same thing that means with, I can't run another meeting at somewhere else, which has happened to me. It means you can't run another right. You can only host one meeting at a time right. with a paid account. Okay. But if if we're using if 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 the hubs buy this account, which is a good idea, spend $150 a year, whoever is authorized to use that account is going to host hub meetings. Nobody else attending that meeting should use that account to sign in, only who is the designated host for that meeting. And then you won't have a problem. And okay. that will free your account, personal account for yeah. your use if you need to host a different meeting at the same time. Good. Okay. Yeah. Are we talking about creating like a special uh, email for each hub to open that account? No. It seems like that no, would just be one, one Zoom host account. Yeah. It'd be the I, hub network account. So Erica's yeah. got her hand up and then Gabrielle's got her hand up. Okay. So I, coming back to Matt's question, in the event that say two hubs want to have their own like meetings at the same time that are different meetings, it sounds like with the pro account, that would not work. With the small business one, would that work? Can you have no. two simultaneous? No, that's just okay. changing the host capacity. It, okay. you, you, need to okay. have a, you need to have a separate account for each user. Okay. That will run yeah. a, a meeting concurrently. I, I was just trying to figure out if the concurrence could be resolved with the small business account, which it sounds like it does not. So, okay. No. No, but but we can yeah. use custom domains or something if we wanted to, but I, I don't think it would make much of a difference for us. Yeah. And so Gabrielle, one of one of those meetings are just going to have to use a free account and log back in after forty minutes, or borrow from somebody else who's you know they, who they has a pro account. In. Yeah. Right. If oh a host would yeah sorry yeah Gabrielle. Yeah, we have the um, NEDC account and, you know, we have a couple groups that use it. So we ask everybody when they create their meeting ID to label exactly when it is so people can see that, you know, the Laurelhurst first Monday meeting, the NEDC first Thursday meeting. So we have it all laid out. And I use a NEDC Seattle Gmail account, which I created. And so I'm very comfortable sharing that with people that I know because they're not accessing my email or an email that's really important at all because it just runs a couple of things that email access. So for me, that works. So the general question is, it sounds like we're all on board with going and getting a, a hub pro account tied to yeah. our hub email because that at least that's consistent. And uh, you know, we'll just work the reimbursement through Hue that's kind of what we've been doing anyway already. Any other suggestions or concerns? Otherwise, we're going to go forward on this. Oh, and Margaret. It, let's see. I can't see if I can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK. It looks like uh, the recording of transcripts was available in the business, but not the pro. Is that correct? <laughs> Well, they, I can do transcripts in mine, my <coughs> personal account. You just turn on closed captioning. Okay, yeah. I don't know if it records it to a, a file though. Yeah, it does. Okay. I, I end up with four files to download yeah. after every one of these meetings. Of course, it's very crappy. Anybody who's ever had to transcribe from the closed captioning kind of complains about it, but. Let me, let me do know, some research on the recording that... transcript. Go if ahead. You have Gabrielle. all that money, is it worth just getting the better one for fifty dollars more? You, since you well, have the money, the trick is look up at the top. This, okay. you know, signing up for a one ninety nine gets you the it's three hundred ninety nine dollar savings. It. Okay. So yeah, not, I think there's a minimum really when you purchase same. small business and number of licenses that you can buy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me let me do some more research on the recording transcripts and find out how how different is that with a business license as opposed to what we can get under the pro. Yeah. Um, I, I can and also, it might be worthwhile. 
yeah i mean if i'm hosting something i i use my enterprise license for volunteer stuff all the time too so um, so are you paying 199 a month or are you paying five i can't do the math six 500 I, a month or 500 a year uh way more than that but that's for seven enterprise. Enterprise. I mean, enterprise yeah and thank you for okay. doing the research on this yeah easy peasy but so, um so if we get an okay on this in between now and our next two months i'd like to get that zoom meeting set up um, Gabrielle is, is kind of, Gabrielle and Gina were our two from our, um, uh, summit or, you know, our, your planning seminar. leadership retreat. Yeah. Thank you. They were going to be the two to sort of pick up and, you know, carry some stuff forward. And I'd like to have this in place for them. So can I get a kind of thumbs up on, let's go spend some money. Okay. I won't spend a thousand, but thank you. And let me get to page two. Yep, thumbs up over there. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay, next on the agenda is a couple of quick updates on stuff. The reunification project is the, how do we uh, help families reconnect or get word out of the area? You know, it's kind of two parts. Get word out of the area that they're okay. Now that we know that the Red Cross Safe and Well website doesn't work. And then how do we do any reunification within Seattle to help families connect? We're working more on the first one. Um, and then Dave Wilma has joined the team. We have a meeting next week with that team. And I think we're getting very close to talking a process by which we can now come back to the hubs and go, this is how it would work at a hub level. Here's how we'd collect the information. Here's how ham radio operators could pass that into what's called the national traffic system to get information out of the area. So we're really excited how close we are. Dave's been doing a lot of research already and is uh, gonna come in and give him a couple of templates he's already thought of. So lots of progress moving forward on that. Any questions on that? And anything else to add? You no, know, the no, second no one we're just sort of holding off on until we get the first part out of the way. So, uh, no question, but... Uh, uh, suggestion to check with uh, how schools are you know relocating children uh, and the the plans that they have uh, in place to do that uh, that might help you uh, th you know their operational uh, plans might help did you guys watch the news with the the something happened at denny blaine high school I don't remember what the threat was, but they just did a reunification process there and they, Como had helicopters hovering over it and you could see the long line of students lined up at the gate to one by one be issued out to the parents all standing over on the other side of the gate. It was really interesting to see. It is good. We hope that they've got a reunification process, but they've never shared it with us. Anne's tried for two years to try and talk to them about that. Well, well, well I can check with more. the Finney Neighborhood Association. They've got a lot of uh, a couple of preschools there, and uh, uh, you know they are supposed to have a plan Thanks. for doing their re reunification. So preschools are going to be a lot different. The just because they have they have different laws that they're under, but um, for public schools, it's few and far between that actually have reunification plans. It's not a district wide thing. It's just if you have a volunteer that has the expertise to help a school develop one, basically. So um, it's not a district-wide thing at all. Seattle oh. kind of delegates that to the principal level. Anne and I helped or participated in a reunification plan at one school a few years ago with a coincident with a disaster preparedness presentation. And they had a fairly well-organized system, but every school is liable to be different in how that it's works. Different. And if you have children in school or grandchildren or whatever, you should contact that school and find out what their plan is so you know. And that's what most we tell parents. Most schools don't have one. Most schools do not have one unless, well, most schools do not have one unless a volunteer has actually help them put it together. But while the principal has responsibility for doing that, they aren't given 
people resources, time resources, financial resources to actually do it. So most of the schools that I've contacted, just because my daughter's school does not have one, uh, most of the schools I've contacted for Seattle Public Schools have said, we don't have one, or they go, I don't even know what that is. So um, it's not something that is district wide. <laughs> Well, I will check with the, the Finney Neighborhood Association uh, emergency response people. Um, they've been pretty good about all, all of their other things related to, you know, they've got uh, supplies stockpiled to, uh, to you know, help hold children in the, uh, the facility for extended periods of time till they can do reunification. Uh, I'll see what their plan is and I'll, uh, I'll try to pass it on to you. Yeah. Schools run the gamut from having nothing in place to being very prepared. It's just like households. It's no different. Frank? Yeah, we brought this up a while ago. Uh, is there a time down the road perhaps for uh, uh, emergency management, the mayor, whatever, to sit down with the head of Seattle Public Schools to have a serious meeting on this? Because uh, John Stanford would have had a very different view of this whole situation than perhaps someone who had not had his experience. Um, you know, there's well, uh, the, the nine tenths of our nine pay grade. Tenths of is, Say again? Well, so yeah, I know. What I'm saying is, that the, I understand that. But the people who are on the screen right now can sit down with people who it's in their pay grade. So what we, we've had... That's all, that's all I'm saying, you know. Ann and I have had conversations with Sophia Lopez, who is the new community engagement person. And we actually right. had a meeting, I don't think we put it on the agenda to talk this time, with Sendai Japan, because we're still trying to talk about what we want to do with them. And they have a huge focus on children and schools. So Sophia had said in the last meeting, she's just getting on board and she really wants to work with the school district. So Ann and I plan to keep bugging her okay. about how are you going to engage with them? Who is your point of contact? How are they incorporating these concepts into the training that Melissa referred to that the principals go through every year? So, you know, the, we can only keep bugging them and pointing out these gaps that they have in their, their plan and they know they have them. They just don't have the bandwidth. It's not their priority at the moment, you know? Hard, hard answer. Okay, uh, next topic is another quick update, uh, pharmacies. Some really interesting progress is happening on that front. The di executive director of the Washington Pharm Pharmacy Association has agreed to create a, a whole set of talking points for community and especially people with disabilities to use around what is the real plan of pharmacies? You know how we always use in our exercise, we're going to, um, take your pill bottle up and, yeah. and show the label and they'll give you a refill. Not so she's gonna, gonna give work. Us, <laughs> she's gonna give us the more real world uh, and saying stock up on chronic meds. Yeah, it is eye opening what this is gonna be like. So we're really excited that we got some people working on it. So outreach materials coming out in the fall to, to sync up with um, earthquake preparedness season. And then they are talking about having kind of a summit. Washington, um, King County Public Health used to coordinate what was called a pharmacy summit, where they brought in pharmaceutical companies to talk about planning and gaps and response and every, get everybody on the same page. And so the executive director has also agreed to sponsor a pharmacy summit. Now, it may not be for all us community members. We may get a few people to attend. But just that the conversation has started again, we're excited. So one, to come one on thing that. to add, Cindy. So yeah. what we learned from pharmacy is that basically they run on a just-in-time uh, restocking system. They don't store months and months worth of meds. They get what they need week by week as they go along, which means for those of us on chronic meds, they're gonna run out in no time. A, they're going to run out. B, it, it takes, there's, they need electricity to the pharmacy in order to open the windows and the bars. And it's just a nightmare. We're not going to be able to get meds. So one of the things the pharmacist, the head pharmacist for the Washington state said was most insurance companies will give you one month emergency refill. 
So between you and I, what I'd like to have people do is if you need to stock up on meds, go to your pharmacist and say, I dropped my bottle of pills in the toilet. So the entire thing is gone. Have the pharmacist call your insurance company and get what's called a, it's like a special, you know, like, oh, we'll let you get another month without charging you. There's a name for it. I can't remember what it's called. Yeah, emergency something, something. Yeah. And see if you can get a 30 day stock of pills without being charged. Um, we're really curious to see how well this works. But if anybody on the call here would try that, it would be fabulous. And, and you can only do it once a year. So, mm -hmm. you know. So a, a comment with regard to, if you get a stock of pills and I'm on a lot of pills and I keep a one week supply of pills in a backpack that's always with me. Once a month, I rotate them out and they become my, I'm using these this week pills and a fresh batch goes in that emergency stock. So if yeah. you do get a contingency stock of, of medications, rotate them out on a periodic basis, whether it's monthly or semi-annually. I wouldn't do them longer than semi-annually. And make sure you store your medications however they're supposed to be stored, because some are sensitive to light, some are sensitive to heat, etc. So all of that goes with a, an emergency stock of pills. And, and on that note, if you've on so many pills like I am, and it sounds like Carl is, you can't drop that many bottles into the toilet. So <laughs> how are we going to do this? <laughs> Every month, drop a different bottle. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, we didn't think to ask whether that was for each prescription or pick, pick one, you know? So we, we'll make sure that that gets into the information that she presents. You guys are good, so. But is there any reason they believe say we could you should connect with your doctor and ask your doctor to give you that extra one month prescription? That might be another option for people too. I, maybe they won't, but. I don't think they'll do it. It's, it's an insurance thing. Yeah. I bet if they Go have ahead. samples. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. the insurance companies that don't let you Get refill early ordered too early yeah kind, yeah and i know you'd want to talk kind of the problem is we get pharmacy you know theoretical people telling us this stuff and when you go to execute it we kind of want to confirm or deny so right. you know i i might try it you know i hadn't really thought about going and doing it but you know just to be able to go no sorry don't put that in that thing because right aid does not do what you just said we do you know so and or it's and going to vary by not, insurance company and by pharmacy and by all, all the different, whoever your medical coverage is, um, they've, they've all got their own policies. Uh, one thing I get is, is mail order uh, prescriptions. I get 90 days on a copay instead of 30 days. And typically out of that 90 days, they'll let me refill a little earlier. So I can, that's how I get my reserve stock. Yep. I do and, the and same I forget, thing. Every time I, yeah, I forget, I've got pretty I good that. reserve stock, same way. Yep. And Bond, did you have something? It's answered. Thank you, though. And then uh, Melissa says, yeah, she said the Kaiser letting her refill. So does anyone offer like supplemental um, insurance? I mean, I know some websites will do prescription deals where you can, you basically subscribe to their service and just order your prescriptions mm -hmm. through them. But all the pharmacy databases talk to one another so that you can't over, you can't get more than you're, well, than you should be taking. So I mean, more that you would fill part of it at your local pharmacy and part of it online and not, not trying to cheat them and get more pills than you're supposed to have. Just, just I don't know. I honestly don't know. Anything else to add on pharmacy, then, Anne? No, huh? Okay. Because you're up next for... Survey results from the hubs um, about what, talking. what we're hosting. I know we're between you and me, we're talking a lot today. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of kind of what we do. Um, so uh, sent out a survey. There was about sixteen of you that answered it. Thank you. Just kind of wanted to get an idea. Um, how many of you want a hub drill? Seven of you said yes. Five of you said no, but I'd like to be involved in somebody else's drill. And four of you said, yes, I want to do it, but I don't want to do a full up drill. Uh, 
kind of depends on COVID. So those were the results for that question. What can we do to support you to help? Um, most of it was, I need volunteers. I'm afraid they aren't gonna come. Um, I need you to help with advertising. I need actors to come. So it was more of the, just the general, you know, please prop mm -hmm. us up kind of, because we don't want to be standing out there by ourselves holding a hub drill and we're the only one in the field. Um, what would help you commit? Nothing really came out, nothing jumped out. And, you know, I went, oh gosh, yeah, we could do that. So um, didn't get a whole lot of information from that question. Again, specific concerns you have about doing a hub drill, nothing really came out. Um, that's it. So I didn't learn a whole lot other than it, it seems like this year might be very similar to past years where we just go, hey, who wants to have a hub drill and let's get them on the calendar and then people can congregate in different areas where they want. Um, on the actor side, if we get our act together and we are far enough in describing what we're doing, um, we had some success several years ago with um, the Department of Neighborhoods has a very large newsletter distribution list and they put events on there. And so if you write it up saying, come participate in this exercise, we need actors, then, then you get people who will show up at least to fill the actor role. You know, that generally does get people. And then we're kind of in this, uh, we got so, we're gonna talk about this. We got so many exercises or, or excuse me, uh, urban skills fairs coming up. We're all doing the same thing. God, do I have enough people to run? So we will talk about the quid pro quo of go help at somebody else's exercise so that they will come help at your exercise. Yeah. <laughs> kind of what I'm hearing too is that it, people just need to bite the bullet and put a date down on paper and make it happen. And you will not be standing out there by yourself. And even if you are, even if it's you and six other people, it will be very valuable. So I think it's just take the plunge, beg for support, and you know, we will all be there as much as we can. Yeah. So Matt's put in a chat that says he wants to do, he's committing, he's just got to pick his date here. Excellent. And I'll tell you, sometimes those dates are crazy. I keep all of our exercises and drills on the hub calendar. So if you want to look and make sure you're not going to, you know, be duplicating on somebody else's date, you can, it just kind of maybe cuts into your um, field of potential hub, other captains who might come and help. I'll just and do it during the storm. Yeah. Don't forget your family. And I rent my granddaughter all <laughs> the time to, you know, yeah. go help at exercises. So yeah. Um, anything else on that one, Ann? Um, along with that, so Victory Heights, my community is having a drill on Saturday, June 18th. Um, I was, I was kind of being a little protective about it and really wanting to engage my neighbors and get somebody else to know how to run this hub other than just Anne and her family. Um, but um, I am more than willing to open it up to whoever wants to come. And my plan is to have a very prescribed list of injects. I want them to come out in a very specific order because I want, I want matches to be made at the resource table. I want information to be impacted at the, you know, at the information tent, all that kind of stuff. So in my goal is to have it very, very scripted so that it is very um, beneficial to each station. So that stack of injects is available to anybody that wants to do exactly what I'm doing. So this is a plug and play kind of thing. Um, so if anybody wants to attend on June 18th, you're welcome. I just invited folks from the city because I am horrified at how little they know about what we do. Um, so hopefully we'll have a good group of people and you know, my community will learn. We're, we're smart people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and at Anne's, we got the new director of Department of Neighborhoods to come to the exercise. Yeah. So we're starting to try that to build that good. relationship yeah. early with him. What time and is Cindy, that again, Anne? Uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. I'm asking folks to sign up to be a hub volunteer for the first ship, 10 to 1130. And then we'll just put any, whoever else wants to step into that second shift. We'll do an on-the-job training kind of thing. 
Cool. Um, I didn't have a chance to tell you, Cindy, but I sent a, an email out to uh, John Hyanga, who's in charge of Seattle Parks. And he got me, he got back to me like an hour later saying, hey, you're good to go. You know, I, I'm working on your, your uh, permit for the park. So to rent a park is, a, it's expensive. You have to have insurance and it's, uh, I want to say it's like, I think it's just like $25 an hour or something like that, but it costs. Because of what we do, we get it free and we don't have to have insurance. So the Seattle Parks Department is playing really nicely with us. Cool, that's great news. Um, then you're on next for multi-building SNAP training. Oh gosh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I taught a class. I, was, I learned as much from them as they did from me. I was trying to figure out um, a change in messaging when you're dealing with folks that share walls with other people. They don't have complete control over their utilities a lot of times. Um, their landlords don't want them to have access to their utilities. Um, you know, there's issues with elevators and stairs and firefighting systems and all that kind of stuff. So um, I taught a class, it was six sessions long, pretty successful, I thought. I, again, I learned a lot from them. I did it for two different buildings. I am meeting with uh, someone from the Office of Emergency Management to see how to move forward with this particular class. It was, I thought it was very, I thought, yeah, we came up with a lot of really good ideas, like hanging a sign in the elevator that says, do you know what happens to this elevator during an earthquake? We do, you know, come find out. That kind of really, kind of provocative almost, um, really personal personal issues for folks living in buildings. Put that in the elevator. And, and so just trying to think of ways to get them to come to classes. So not sure what the future holds, but I think it was pretty successful. Like I said, I learned a lot. Um, they have some interesting issues. So in, and in addition to that, Ann and I are running a, kind of a pilot. Um, High Point, we'll talk about their skills fair coming up. They are a very large SHA community and, um, you know, trying to talk to people who live in apartments that they can't even, con you know, control because they're all these joint utilities or they're locked away because SHA doesn't want them to have access, you know, and do something crazy with the equipment. Um, we're going to be doing a skills fair and trying to talk to that population about controlling utilities. And so we got a tour today an excellent tour with uh, one of the SHA property managers. He took us into multiple units so we could take pictures of what their water tanks look like so that we can have visuals for these kinds of residents to say, here's where you turn off your water and here's what your gas meters look like. And we're coordinating the message with SHA property managers to say, oh, thank you, to say, you know, the vo you know we're being the voice that they want. And we're also learning at the same time how they manage all their properties like within these huge swaths of Seattle. So many of us have lots of SHA housing within our neighborhoods. You just don't know it. You know, SHA owns a ton of stuff. So our next step after, you know, kind of test running this in Southwest is to get with the emergency manager for SHA who trains all the built property managers and talk with them about steps and like ordering some blue tags for our event coming up that we can just write on it and say, water shut off here at in emergencies. So it's there and they, you know, remember it a year from now when the disaster happens, they can at least open the utility closet and go, blue tag, turn it off, you know. So it's it, multifamily is really becoming a topic at the forefront. So we'll get that information out to you. Is And question, is there a list of all their housing so we can identify in the uh, I'll talk later about that. I, in my next, one of my next reports, I'll make sure I talk about what it was like trying to get that information out of SHA. So uh, other questions on multifamily and doing SNAP training. We'll just let Ann fill us in on how that goes. Okay. Uh, okay, good. I am on the next one. One concern mapping. So uh, I'm running the pilot out here in West Seattle. We've had two of three meetings where we took those building damage maps talk to the community about what that means and who it impacts. And our third meeting is 
So what are we going to do about it? You know, what kind of pre-steps can happen um, to, to have a plan? What will we do about the Kenny home? Do we know what their uh, disaster response plan is? And so Margaret, in, the, in that vein, I was trying to find out, well, how many SHA residents or buildings are in our neighborhoods, kind of in the thinking of, if you're economically distressed, you might not have a lot of supplies. And, and so they actually gave me the numbers. They did not give me the locations. But so I have the contact who will at least say in these zip codes, and they do it by zip codes, you sort of have to, you know, hopefully you don't share zip codes with really high density areas. They will give you that kind of information. But there's a fallacy in that. I kind of was going, well, I could go look at the really old apartment buildings, you know, that are still going to be standing, but you know, that might mean people who are living at the borderline of their manageable income. But you know, in today's environment with COVID, you could be living in a really fancy building and be paying 40% of your rent, you know, so you just can't look at stuff and tell anymore. But knowing that who your SHA clientele is, you know, what the volume is it, if, if it's 10% of your population, that might be a big signal that, you know, you might have want to prepare a different plan. So Catherine had done the first step of hers, which was show the building damage in her kind of central district, Madison Valley area. And, you know, she, she had not been to that community group to talk about disaster preparedness before, where I had been to Morgan over and over again, because they're really involved in the hub. And she kind of got the eyes, eyes big wide. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's not, she hasn't figured out what her next step wants to be, but at least she's cracked the nut and had the conversation and it was well received. It wasn't like people stood up and said, oh, you're, you're full of it, you know, go away. So if there's other people who want to do that, we've got the format sort of put together and it's kind of, con you can plug and play your numbers if you want. So just, if you get around to that, that's more better to do in the winter when you know, you're doing meetings. We're using summer for the exciting stuff, but just let us know. Catherine can help too. Um, I am going to sneak an item in. So Erica, Catherine, and Melissa are the three people who are going to map our hubs into the GIS layers in the city. And so they're working up a process. They've already, they all know what they're doing. They just slammed into it. TJ's got them trained. We've got a little video that we made of TJ's training session so that if we have future people who need, you know, kind of a, how do you do this? We've got a visual for them. And then that process will be put in our Google Drive so that we can always keep our hub layer active um, for OEM. And then that's how we'll get our printed maps in the future. So, so that thank you to the three people who volunteered for that. And next to Anne is outreach events. See the list below on the agenda. Uh, I Do you have something to bring up, Anne? Uh, no. Good, um, I will, I'll bring it up because I, I put it up here. Please do, now. yeah. Um, real quick before Cindy gets that up. So there's a, there's a I wanna say an app, but that's not the right word. It's a website. It, it's called Sign Up. It's all one word, signup.com. And I use that to give a place for volunteers to sign up so they can, they can choose, I wanna be the hub captain or the greeter or whatever, or it's a skills fair and I wanna be at the water station or the utility station or the amateur radio station. So those are, those are built and super easy for me to either modify for you or transfer ownership to you and you can play around with it, either one. Um, I think it's very helpful to help, to help you keep track of volunteers and what they want to do and you can see where your holes are. So either get comfortable with that program or ask me to get, you know, ask me to modify it for you. It's super, super easy once you know how to use it. But um, I think it's a really good tool and I don't think we're using it as, as broadly as we could. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just not everybody's is aware of it. Yeah, I've used Sign Up Genius and it's not nearly as good as Sign Up is. Yeah, but basically the same thing. Yeah. So the, here on the screen is the list of outreach events. And um, so 
really what I want to point out is, you know, the Hub 101s are kind of for the local folks, but we have a lot of survival skills fairs and we all are going, oh my God, you know, even if you've scaled it down from not 15 tables, it still feels like a lot when you're trying to staff six tables and figure out the activities. So I know that um, East Lake had put out a request and then kind of due to some covid sort of related emergencies that got moved out to later. So the near-term need is definitely at high point. And so we'll be sending out an email. Uh, that is the same day as the ACS drill. So that's kind of a problem. But uh, if we can get the word out to hubs that weren't gonna activate their own area and still have time on that day to help us, that would be appreciated. And then, Ann, do you know need if Roosevelt needs help? Um, it's hard to tell because there's not a sign up built, but Ellen is working on that today. Um, so that's the other thing is you can't, nobody can tell how things are going if there's not a website where folks are signed up. Um, so, well, yeah. For, for Johnny, for example, he knows he needs like four people. So it's not like a full full thing, but if we can just send an email out to the hub captains for that one, that's probably an easy one. But the larger ones, I, you, I would recommend maybe doing the sign up. Yeah. yeah. And um, I just modified like the, the event mm -hmm. on the calendar, on the hub calendar, I just modified it and put my sign up for the Victory Heights event. And I'll do the same thing for Roosevelt when they get theirs up and running so that if you can't find it in, you know, the minutes or whatever, you can go to the hub calendar and find the signups and start, start pinging on them through there. We spoke about quid pro quo before. I will move my child's birthday party. Buddy who, uh, quid pro quo, anyone who uh, can find some volunteer time to come out to High Point. <laughs> And Anne, uh, Anne Bond, <laughs> when I said, when I said, I have an offer for you, you know, this was the day I was going like, oh, geez, we're, we're coming up within 10 days and we still got a couple of gaps. So anybody who can help, please, you know, respond to the email when I send it out. Um, Victory Heights, we've covered El Centro. Um, oh, I, I'm going to go back to the high point one. That is where we are going to have three different languages. So we're going to do a skills fair for the first time where translators are there for three languages. They will just go from table to table to table. And let's say the Vietnamese family comes up, they will just hook into wherever the translator is and then they'll move around. And when they get back to the table that they started at, they just drop July off 28. and they keep moving around. So if you want to see how that's going to work. That's the first time we've ever done it. It may be a mess. It may work out really good. And we'll have a lot of the translated material. And then that also is going to be the same um, uh, approach at El Centro. At the least July 9th event. event. Yeah. And I should spell Eastlake, right? And then Gina, if Gina's still on, um, I got the word of your uh, practice session that you're thinking of doing on September 14th. I don't know if you wanted to recruit anybody or if it's going to be smaller and local. Did you want to say anything about that? Uh, I would love to get extra help with that. Okay. So we'll be putting this on the agenda. We'll try and send this out on a regular basis so people can, as their calendars clear up, make sure you lock it in or, or quid pro quo yourself in for a deal. So. Uh, Cindy, that said Thursday, July 27th. I don't think that is the correct. Well, that is, could be entirely possible. It's yeah, Wednesday, and, and Wednesday, the 27th, or it's which, Thursday, which the 28th, which is the same night as our meeting. You know, it's Wednesday, the 27th. Sorry, okay. Pat. I changed that to Wednesday, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the Brayburn one is on a Sunday. Oh, okay. I will fix those. I, they may be right on the calendar. I don't know. <laughs> I, I know the one, on, I know Wednesday is right on the calendar. The message here is don't send Cindy an email. Oh my gosh. It's, it's so bad. There's so much stuff going on, but that's fantastic in a lot of ways. And, you know, that isn't even all the exercises that Ann was just 
you know, talking to people about getting your hubs out to do their thing as opposed to doing survival skills fairs, which are more outreach events. So we, we, we look like we're going to have a good balance of stuff coming up this year. Thank God we can get out in the field. Uh, last thing is um, both Jim and Melissa dropped off. Jim is aware that he's still got his action on volunteer, you know, working through that volunteer. How do we manage them? He's had a couple of family challenges. And um, so Melissa is pe pegged up with him, you know, so it's coming. It's just not all the way, all the way here yet. And then the last thing on in the miscellaneous stuff is that Hugh has given us that we have $5,777. Thank you, Hugh, for remembering to send that so I could put it in the agenda and we've got it in the minutes now. Is it time for the annual party? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Unspent in at the end of the year funds. <laughs> So now we have time for around the room and we got more than 30 minutes, that's perfect. So I'm gonna ask you to put your hands up because I don't know who's out there who wants to, to talk something. And Ellen says, yes, Roosevelt would need uh, help in their thing. I so I, I, Roosevelt, I'm very close. Susanna has got her hand up, go ahead. So yes, um, I have my hand up because field day for the uh, for amateur radio operators is coming up uh, in June, June 25th and 26th. And one of the things that, that ACS is interested in is getting a few more women uh, to consider becoming great amateur radio operators. So we want to invite all the people in the hubs uh, that might be interested, especially women, but hey, I don't think we would ever discriminate against anybody who was to, who's interested in becoming a ham. So, at uh, three o'clock on the afternoon of the 25th of June, we are gonna have a gathering uh, at Field Day, which is uh, at South Seattle Community College in uh, adjacent to the North parking lot. So I will uh, get an email put together so that, that people will have the exact location where Field Day will be. So it's, it's almost always at, at South Seattle Community College, but it is a different end of, Community college. This this year, it's going to be at the north end, uh, on the uh, in the parking lot at the north end. There's going to be a motorcycle event going on there, and we will be to the west of where the motorcycle event goes on in, in the parking lot. But I'll get have, go ahead. Anderson. You'll have the tent set up, so it'll be pretty visible, right? It should be visible, and there'll be a big antenna. So yeah, look for you know you can always find always find an amateur radio operator by the antenna. Uh, so anyway, so all women, especially, but anyone who's interested in becoming a ham wants to learn more about it. Uh, we're going to certainly have some cookies or something, something to, to munch on as well. So come and join us. It can be, you know, so, so for, go ahead. I was just going to say, so for people that are already hams, but are underutilizing their license, is that a good opportunity to come out for that as well? That would be wonderful. Yes. Yes. And, and, uh, would like a little support. I mean, it can be a little, uh, sometimes it's a little intimidating because you can get married in equipment and in computer programs and everything else. But we want to get people that are not using their license would like a little help, support, come on along. Okay, I have to raise my hand because I can't raise my hand on the, but it ties in with what Suzanne is at. The meeting I came at from just before this meeting, the West Seattle <laughs> Amateur Radio Club um, has been tasked to help with some informational tables at field day and so they they're pretty well plugged into the hubs and so they've asked if we can have a hub outreach table at field day as well and i would expect that that is they hadn't said whether it's both saturday and sunday and so be prepared that i'll put out a message on that and that you know again is june 25th and you know it's just kind of a typical we're not going to do a skills fair we'll just do a typical what are the hubs outreach table should be pretty easy to staff and especially if you're going to come, you know, for other things, you know, the, some of the other activities that go on, the um, contesting or those those who have licenses. Are they um, still camp out They've, overnight? I do not think so. Um, we've camped out before, but that was under the guise of guard duty, so it's not a full overnight. 
<laughs> deal that I know of. We can get that clarified. Me, uh, Carl knows? Carl might know, yeah. I don't know if he'll be allowed to camp, but field day runs continuous 24 hours so there will people there will be people there there will be people active in the in the various tents with radios um it's a great opportunity to come and see ham radio in real life practice so everybody's welcome public's welcome uh, you don't have to have a passion to run a radio just stop by and say hi it's a big contesting event and so part of the camping out question is I've seen people stagger out of the tent having contested for 12 hours and they go sleep in their car for four hours so they can get up again and make more points. It's a really interesting world to tap into. So, uh, other around the rooms that we haven't covered. Yeah, see, we were too efficient. We covered it all up, up at front. We, you guys have been doing really great about keeping us informed of what your plans are. So it's less of the surprises and sudden announcements. Carl's got his hand up again. Um, Cindy has mentioned Sophia down at OEM. She's the new public outreach coordinator manager. And I wanted to comment, she is also reaching out to all of the volunteers who work with OEM on, on public education to get that group revitalized and back in action. I'm guessing Cheryl and Anne have probably been talking with, with Sophia and, and others. And I think that's good. So, you know, public outreach has kind of been on a hiatus through all of COVID and that they're going to start getting that aspect of OEM moving again also. So good information. Just be aware that it's, it's out there. The opportunities are there. If you have a neighborhood group or a business or anybody else that would like a presentation from OEM, go on their website, sign up for it and ask for it. Okay, uh, you guys are looking like you want to get out early. Hmm. Uh, next deep dive is June 14. <laughs> and I saw Ann go, <laughs> I don't know if we have a topic yet. I mean, we, we have a, a, a huge queue of stuff. I don't know if we picked anything yet. So that will be June 14. And our next hub captain meeting won't be until July. So almost all those events, yeah, all those events except one will be under our belt by then. So it feels like it's going to be a pretty busy two months. So June 14th is a Tuesday. Is that right? Oh, don't do this to me. Yeah, <laughs> deep dives are always on Tuesday. I got it. I thought I put the hub captain meeting on a Tuesday. <laughs> Linda, you got your hand up. I have my hand up. Um, oh, I have a question because <clears throat> I bit my participation here has been a little spotty over the last few months and maybe you've already covered this but um i know we, map your neighborhoods was phased out and we were supposedly all um transferring uh, transferring into this uh two weeks ready program and i saw a beta version of that app a long long time ago and now i'm wondering what happened to it okay they had a two-hour meeting on it yesterday and so they put out the, the state is coordinating this. They put out their drafts of all the new modules and they asked, this was a statewide meeting and they asked all the um, emergency managers to give them input and they got an earful. So I don't think it's gonna come out soon. Um, what they had written was like the dictionary of all emergency preparedness. And so a lot of folks said it's too complicated. Um, People aren't going to read it. We, um, the intent was for it to be a lot online and people are pushing back. And so I think they, I think it's not coming out soon. Let's, let's put it that way. Okay, thanks for the update. Mm -hmm. All right, no other questions. I'm going to let you guys go early. And so we owe you some information about exercise coming up, uh, messaging, you know, procedure, um, outreach opportunities that you need volunteers for, calls for things. And we have to figure out how to distribute the forms and get them out to you before, before the exercise starts. So Ann, Ann and I'll work out that. Thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you in uh, June 14th. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Cindy. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody.